as the logline suggests, Into the Dark follows an international team of scientists who venture off on a perilous winter expedition into the darkest regions of the Arctic. Their mission? To understand how trace amounts of light may be radically altering the mysterious world of the polar night. In a bit simpler English, they are seeking to find out the effects of light on the Arctic on a polar night. The results of this expedition range from discovering the negative effects of climate change to being able to address the future of the Arctic. They tend to really emphasize natural sound once the audience is immersed in the POV style shots. This helps audience feel part of the production and part of the experience and in a small way, being practically present or at least feeling like you're practically present can help keep you engaged even if you don't really share the same interests or quite understand what's happening. So that's why we are here. We really want to look at those small, really important organisms because they are the the key groups in, in the ecosystems. Without those key groups, there, there will be no life. Simple as that. They use extremely shallow depth of field here, which is really nice in that it eliminates any potential disturbances from the background and allows us to take in all the information being given. This is especially important given that this information is really serious. Okay, so for the next clip, please take note of the point of view shot and how the dangerous high seas really feel real and are helped by the natural sound that exists. The person who vomits really adds to the very real nature of the seasickness and further immerses us into the space. The person being ambiguous as to who it really is is a bit annoying in my opinion. Knowing who the person is would help the audience kind of relate or attach to the character because it's a very real thing. The following part is also a bit long but I do think that it is a climax and I don't want to interrupt it so I'd like for us to pay attention to the music as it really starts to pick up in anticipation for the big event. Okay, we are at the edge of the ice now, so push it back a little bit. I'm trying to adjust the uh, echo sounder so it's flat. We have the best result as possible. That's it? Looks good? I would personally say that the documentary could have done a better job of building our anticipation 
even with simply using a time for the big event. They do tell us the days, for example, tell us this day four. Um, but I do think that it would have been nicer if they made it a bit more clear, as many viewers will not really understand what is happening. Nonetheless, at this point, the documentary is definitely at its peak. The lights come off in such a dramatic fashion. And with the music, this kind of becomes a really big event. It feels like a really powerful moment. Almost entirely for ourselves. It's a very special feeling to, to, to be out there. For a, for a short while, it is absolutely total dark. This is the most intimate part of the documentary. And it's so silent and it's so dark. Furthermore, it happens just after the immense noise. So we're kind of almost tricked by the filmmaker to not only appreciate the darkness, but to appreciate the silence. Jorgen really appears so much more human in this awkward lighting simply because he speaks to us from the heart. We don't really need to understand the mission, but we really understand just what it means to the world, but most importantly, what this mission means to him, because this affects how the audience reacts to it. I do feel that Jorgen, our main character, isn't really fleshed out as a human being throughout the documentary, and granted it's only 29 minutes, I do feel that if we felt more for him, we'd be more invested in the documentary, in the parts where he is extremely intimate and communicating to us from the heart, I really do feel if there are more of those moments, it would make this one even more impactful. The lack of main character makes it very difficult for us to connect to a specific person. The science and the cinematic nature is beautiful and concise and makes sense, but I do wish that we did have a main character to follow throughout the entire piece. No, knowing that that this region is going through these massive changes f fills me with bo both gratitude that we are able to see it while, while we have it, but also a sadness that it might not be here for our for the next generation, for my children, that they will maybe not be able to to experience and explore. This untouched part of and frozen part of the Arctic. You can tell them to turn right on. The lights coming back on are not even treated as an event. There's no music playing and the lights switching on room by room isn't done in the same way when the lights are switching off. This keeps with the tone of our main character's love for the dark but not celebrating the presence of the light again. We go and we pop that in there and what we have, let's see if we've got a wee signal here. Come on, don't let me down. I wonder if the decision for optic specialist David McKee to be the person who reacts to the findings of the expedition was a decision made on site or was it made during post-production? Because at least for me, his vibrant personality and excitement is exactly what is needed right now. More and then I'm going for my dinner. <laughs> got you, got you. Bolly, no bother. So this crazy wee graph, which is showing a very small increase. And this tiny change in fluorescence is the signs of life in the plants. It's that they're still just hanging on and no more. And this this horribly wee signal is very hard to get. So it's quite exciting to see that it's still there and that, that we've got just enough sensitivity to be able to, to resolve this. You know, you just got to keep persevering. Perseverance, man. That's what it's all about. 
the sunrise appears, signifying the beginning of the light, the end of the journey or expedition, and it's time to go home. I do have to say that I don't like the sad, grim tone of the music, even though it does keep up with the tone. I do think that it's a lot more grimmer than the previous music that they used in the documentary. I also think that the facts that come up aren't necessarily incorrect, but they do kind of add a more somber view. But what really does save the documentary's ending is that it has a nice, cycle-like ending. With Jorgen being the first person to speak in the beginning of the documentary, and the last person to speak in the last 30 seconds of the documentary. It scares me to realize that we are affecting the climate. At the same time, it also brings some hope. Into the Dark is quite clearly an observational style documentary, with some parts of it being the expository style documentary style, which makes sense because the interview interviewee kind of space where the interviewer says nothing at all. Also, with almost the fly on the wall throughout the entire documentary, where we observe everything that happens, the experiment, and all the findings. It also makes sense to assume that there's more than one documentary style at play here, because as Bill Nichols says, All documentaries make use of one or more of them. Another thing that this documentary does very well, which I wanted to talk about at the end, is its use of lighting. When you guys see it again, I hope you guys take the time to really observe the way that they use light. They use light in such a way that is very cinematic, which makes it seem very high-end, almost like a film. This is because they use two very important aspects of filmmaking, or rather, lighting in film. They shoot shadow side, and they play well with contrast. The idea of shooting shadow side is that whatever side your light is placed on, your camera needs to be on the other side of the subject. This might seem like something really simple, but you wouldn't believe the difference it makes. And you also wouldn't believe how many people don't do this. And I challenge you, go choose any movie off your shelf and try to find a shot that isn't on the shadow side of the subject. It's really difficult because almost every shot in a movie is on the shadow side. Now the reason they do this is because it gives a much more dramatic feel to the scene, it adds depth to the person's face, and also adds more of a three-dimensional element. By putting complementing colors in your films to separate your subject, you're not only going to make your film look more cinematic, but you're going to add separation from your subject and the background by having two different complementing colors in the same shot. This is what lured me to this documentary. At a personal level, I'm in love with cinematic style, I'm in love with films in general, and I would love nothing more than to make films of this nature that use a lot of lighting, use a lot of contrast, which really make a cinematic look. Not for it to look any different from the way you'd see blockbuster films, if not blockbuster, indie films, but using light to really tell a story and using light to really emphasize things.